Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to, to open our, our final plenary and a double pleasure to introduce uh, the man who's going to moderate the discussion and, and uh, make some opening remarks, uh, the Foreign Minister of Norway, Jonas Storr, who has served in that position since 2005, before which he was the Secretary General of the Norwegian Red Cross. As you look in his bio, you see there's a, a distinguished record of involvement in, in uh, world health issues uh, and also in international organizations, the UN in Geneva. Um, the part in the bio that was most intriguing to me was, was that he was a teaching fellow at the Harvard Negotiation Project uh, at the Harvard Law School in 1986, which those of us uh, who remember those years remember that there was a lot of very innovative work uh, being done at that project that, that helped develop some of the pathways for negotiating the nuclear arms reduction uh, treaties at that time. And so I was intrigued to see that in his, in his pedigree. Um, in his current position as Foreign Minister of Norway, of course, uh, he has helped uh, lead the Norwegian effort in leading the Seven Nation Initiative, uh, which has been very instrumental in, in supporting uh, a lot of the thinking that, that actors in this uh, room uh, are engaged in, a lot of the Track 2 work. And so Norway has played a most constructive role in trying to build the international nuclear order uh, that's the theme of this uh, conference. Um, in best, uh, Foreign Minister Storr uh, has had a, an official meeting rescheduled so that he will have to leave uh, around 3.15 and I'll take over moderating the session. So when you see this little minuet, uh, that's what's happening is, is um, that he now has to, to uh, uh, earn his uh, his, his uh, 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 salary here uh, and work this afternoon uh, rather than uh, enjoy the uh, uh, rest of the time um, in this playful exercise of dealing with nuclear uh, order questions that we're all engaged in. Um, so let me get out of the way and welcome Foreign Minister Storm. Thank you, Mr. Perkovich. I can assure you that I'm also being paid for being here <laughs> by, <laughs> by my government because it's very meaningful and it's part of uh, what the Norwegian foreign minister should do. Uh, it's an honor to be able to speak and to moderate such a distinguished gathering of speakers and to address such uh, an impressive gathering of expert policy makers on a very important theme, scholars and diplomats. Let me also express my thanks to the Carnegie Endowment, to Dr. Jessica Matthews for inviting me. And uh, the Carnegie is a, is a close partner of Norway in so many, so many areas. Today it's disarmament. It could be another theme another day. Uh, and I appreciate that relationship. Let me first, uh, before starting, making a, a personal reflection. I sense, and I think we all sense, that the topic of this conference is re-entering re -entering the international agenda. The agreement between Presidents Obama and Medvedev to restart negotiations on START was one telling sign. And President Obama's speech in Prague last uh, Sunday, yet another clear signal. And Norway welcomes these concrete steps and the leadership that the President is now demonstrating. The speech marks U.S. leadership and a much-needed determination to advance nuclear disarmament and to strengthen the non-proliferation regime. Now, it is up to all of us to have these concrete steps implemented, implemented seize the opportunity, and, and take responsibility. We are one year ahead of the NPT review conference. The last one failed in 2005. Since then, we have had every reason to fear that the 2010 conference would be a repetition of failure, and that the NPT, as such, would sail into sunset. Now we have reason to hope that change may be coming, that political energy will be mobilized, that ambitious and at the same time realistic agendas will be defined. I have often reflected on the following. When I was a student in the early 1980s, and by the way, that was a good time at Harvard, and I would like to discuss that with you <laughs> at some occasion. The nuclear issue during those years were on the global, uh, were on the global agenda. Between the two superpowers, 
and as a forceful mobilizer of public opinion. We had Reykjavik in 1986, the unbelievable moment, and the vision of a world without nuclear weapons and the successive agreements and efforts to reduce the stocks. Then the Cold War came to an end and the nuclear disarmament issue left the global agenda. As my generation got into political positions, new issues emerged. The environment, climate change, fight against extreme poverty, terrorism, human rights, and so on. That's where we spent our time. But of course, we cannot fool ourselves. The problem of thousands of warheads will not go away. As years go by, their challenge to all of us continue to increase. And I was intrigued by this line in President Obama's speech, quote, the threat on global, of global nuclear war has gone down, but the risk of a nuclear attack has gone up, end of quote. So now, finally, nuclear disarmament is re-emerging, challenging us, obliging us to engage. A new generation will have to take charge, finding new ways, drawing on existing expertise and experience, but paving new roads ahead. This conference, I believe, is an important contribution to that end. Norway, as a non-nuclear weapon state, will do its part in setting and bringing this agenda forward. Since 2005, we have been working through the so-called Seven-Nation Initiative. This initiative contains both nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states. I'm happy to see Indonesia here, a partner in that initiative. And we are happy to work together with these countries, the United Kingdom, Australia, Indonesia, South Africa, Chile, and Romania. Norway has also, over the last years, been cooperating with a number of important think tanks, in particular in the United States, with the aim of strengthening the agenda for non-proliferation and disarmament. And I saw a lot of uh, the people here in Oslo at our conference uh, last February 2008, more than a year ago. We will continue to build these and other relationships. By engaging these institutions and institutes, we get new ideas on how to move the disarmament and non-proliferation realistic steps forward. So ladies and gentlemen, in addition to the new dynamic in the US-Russian uh, relationship and President Obama's ambitious and concrete speech in Prague, we have the release last week of the report of the US Strategic Poster Commission and we await with keen interest the report of the International Commission chaired by Gareth Evans here in the panel and Yuriko Kawaguchi. And again, we are entering the last leg of the preparations for the 2010 NPT Review Conference. What I see is how a common understanding may be taking shape. We cannot consolidate and sustain non-proliferation while neglecting disarmament steps towards a free world free of nuclear weapons. And consequently, we will, that we will delay or undermine nuclear disarmament unless we demand robust and credible non-proliferation. They all hang together. We now see that the abolitionists can be realists and that realists can also be abolitionists. And confronted with 21st century threats, we are finally dispensing with the mistaken assumption that the status quo is less risky than change. But as often the case at moments of great opportunity, we are confronted not only with the possibility of progress, but simultaneously with the prospect of peril and regress. Time is here of essence. Many states today face a critical choice about their nuclear future. They already have or could rapidly accum accumulate the technology, know-how and infrastructure to develop uh, a weapon usable domestic nuclear fuel cycle capability. Whether those states choose to take part in multilateral fuel arrangements or whether they will feel that they must hedge their bets will depend on how we use this moment of opportunity. My government decided as one of the first countries to offer financial support to a future fuel bank of low and rich uranium under the auspices of the IAEA. We are pleased that the fuel bank now will become a reality being fully funded. This fuel bank could be the first step towards establishing an equitable multilateral framework, framework for the fuel cycle. So this is the fundamental question. Are we facing a future security environment in which nuclear weapons will persist, if not expand, 
or one in which their role is steadily and foreseeable diminishing. I believe that in seizing this moment of opportunity, we should be guided by four principles, and I'd like to draw them with you. The first principle is that we begin taking concrete steps to sustain our vision and build momentum behind it. Because without that vision, everything else we do will have less direction. This principle has been referred to in the base camp and vantage point discussions over the last two days. While the content might be contested, the principle should not. In order to begin addressing the thorniest questions about the world free of nuclear weapons, we need to demonstrate that we can muster the thrust and cooperation to address more intermediate obstacles. Even small demonstrations of our willingness to move forward towards abolition could make many of the intermediate obstacles more surmountable, more realistic, more within reach. The general terrain of a base camp or vantage point has been clear for some years now. Significant cuts in nuclear arsenals, probably in proportion to current holdings, reducing the role of nuclear weapons in doctrines and in operational status, ratifying the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and reaching agreement on the Fissile Material Cut-Off Treaty, and making good on the commitments made in 1995 and 2000. I note that several of these elements are covered in President Obama's address in Prague, and I war warmly welcome this. A second principle is this. Although a prime responsibility for moving forward resides with the two states who own 95% of the warheads, Russia and the US, achieving a world free of nuclear weapons must be a joint enterprise among all states, nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states alike, such as my own. It is only by advancing non-proliferation and disarmament together and by working together on the reliable verification tools and collective security arrangements that our vision will be achievable. Non-nuclear weapon states, for instance, should cooperate with nuclear weapon states to develop the technology needed for verif verifying disarmament. In this spirit, Norway has established a partnership with the United Kingdom and Vertic. The aim is to develop systems by which we can verify that actual disarmament really takes place while at the same time protecting sensitive information. We, non-nuclear weapon states in particular, must engage in an earnest, even soul-searching discussion about the future of security guarantees and alliances in a world with far fewer and even zero nuclear weapons. Within NATO, Norway and Germany have initiated a new discussion on enhancing alliance role in regarding non-proliferation and disarmament. That ambition was confirmed in the NATO summit declaration last Saturday. Now we have a solid platform to move forward. Non-nuclear weapon states can also make a crucial contribution by supporting and sustaining a watertight non-proliferation regime. We must close existing loopholes and empower the IAEA. The establishment of regional nuclear weapons free zones is another important contribution by non-nuclear weapon states to achieving the zero option. The entry into force of the African zone is imminent. Norway is financially supporting a project carried out by, by a South African institute to secure the last accessions needed for the Treaty of Pelindaba to enter into force. Establishing this nuclear weapons-free zone would be an important deliverable to the NPT review conference. And I would like to uh, underline here that in my conversations with Secretary Clinton yesterday, we agreed to take forward part of that cooperation also between governments. As a third principle, we must try to uphold two key elements of effective multilateral cooperation, non-discrimination and transparency. Nuclear weapons impose, above all, collective dangers. We must confront proliferation with unity and resolve, no matter where it occurs. We must demonstrate that our motivation to enforce the rules of the game is principled, not prejudiced. We must move forward with disarmament agreements that include all states. We should acknowledge that nuclear fuel assurances will succeed only on the basis of a non-discriminatory approach that recognizes rights to peaceful use and energy security, qualified only by even-handed rules of responsibility and verification. Norway recognizes the right of peaceful use of nuclear energy according to Article 4 of the NPT, 
while at the same time underlining the safety aspect. Transparency, meanwhile, is required from both nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states as a means of building the vital elements of trust and confidence. Adoption of the IAEA additional protocol is in this context essential. Nuclear weapon states must demonstrate enhanced transparency on their holdings of nuclear weapons, fissile material, operational status, and doctrines. To be sure, in the long, time, long term, the challenges to transparency could eventually grow as reductions in nuclear arsenals grow deeper. But in the short term, transparency is indispensable. Finally, as a fourth principle, achieving the vision of a world free of nuclear weapons will demand committed leadership at the highest level. Prerequisites for reaching the goal of nuclear abolition are courage, determination, and competence. Only with these qualities can we drive the process of transformation and change the course of history. The discussions at this conference have revealed that getting to a base camp or a vantage point, let alone nuclear abolition, will require a fundamental rethinking of our international security architecture. Such an enterprise demands the personal commitment of national leaders. National leaders will have to engage with all key domestic stakeholders, ranging from defense establishment to energy companies to the scientific community, and so on. Above all, direct engagement with the public will be critical. Altering entrenched assumptions, creating new priorities, and marshalling the combined energy of government and civil society will require extraordinary courage and conviction on the part of national leaders. This can only be sustained by broad public support for a world of free of nuclear weapons. There is no time to lose. I hope, ladies and gentlemen and dear panel, that these four principles can inform and inspire our preparations for the 2010 Review Conference, a conference that we cannot let fail and that our ascent far beyond it as well will be inspired by our common resolve. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you for your attention. And now, uh, I will not speak again, but I will be able to introduce the first speaker uh, on our panel. Uh, somebody who has been a champion for a number of international causes during many, many years, disarmament as well. I am pleased to, inform, to, to introduce uh, Gareth Evans, International Commission on Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament. Gareth. Well, thank you, Eunice, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. A number, of you, a number of you have asked me over the last day or so, some rather more politely than others, as to what the hell is the value that could possibly be added by a new Blue Ribbon International Commission on Nuclear Nonproliferation and Disarmament, given that there's been so many of these kinds of bodies giving so many reports and so many good recommendations over recent years. It's certainly a question that I ask myself when... Australian Prime Minister asked me, along with the Japanese Prime Minister, to sit in train. This new body, co-chaired by me and my former Japanese Foreign Minister colleague, Yoriko Kawaguchi. But I think there is a reasonable answer that we can give to you. The first is the timing of this enterprise. We really are finding ourselves riding a wave as compared with trying to hold the line or build barriers against a tide of indifference or hostility, which was rather the experience of the Canberra Commission, the Blix Commission, and others before us. Secondly, the composition of the Commission is really extraordinarily broadly representative. It's not just an Australia-Japan enterprise, it's a global enterprise with members on it, albeit in their personal capacity, from all P5 countries, for example, Bill Perry from the United States, Alexei Bartov here with us today from Russia, uh, but also India, Pakistan, and a number of other key countries as well, including Norway and Indonesia on today's panel. And the Secretariat for the Commission is really a virtual worldwide enterprise, uh, drawing on the skills of the large number of associated research centres, including for the United States, uh, Carnegie, with uh, George Perkovich being uh, one of our crucial research consultants. The third thing is the actual approach that the Commission will adopt. Uh, we're aiming, first of all, to be comprehensive in the sense of addressing quite systematically all three dimensions of disarmament, non-proliferation, and civil nuclear energy, some of which have tended to drop by the wayside a little bit in some of the earlier reports, and to package the issues 
even when we're saying stuff that's pretty familiar, in a way that really is systematic and brings together and shows the interrelationships uh, between the issues. Uh, again, as to approach, and this is very important, we want to make the results of our work very accessible, particularly to policymakers, given that the primary object of this exercise is to energize a high-level political debate among political leaderships around the world. I think we have to acknowledge that a lot of the stuff that's been written in the past has been the nuclear priesthood talking to other members of the nuclear priesthood, wonks talking to wonks, uh, without much in the way of effective communication to people in high places, a lot of whom, in respect of which this stuff just flies over their heads. And we want to address the issues in a rather different way. Uh, we want to be realistic in our recommendations, uh, tempering idealism with a pretty fair measure of pragmatism, uh, tempering our optimism uh, with a pretty, pretty fair measure of realism, not in a way to abandon the ultimate objectives of all of this, but hopefully in a way that will have resonance with policymakers. And we want to be finally very action-oriented, not just producing rather undifferentiated laundry lists of recommendations, uh, but rather... Uh, combining our recommendations into short, medium and longer term action plans which will hopefully have some utility for people in the, the real world of trying to put this stuff together. We're consulting all around the world at the moment uh, as this enterprise proceeds, including with civil nuclear industry and are hoping that uh, our first major and most substantial report will in fact be out at the end of the year so that it can feed very directly into the last six months of the debate preceding the May 2010 NPT review conference. Although the Commission will have a life beyond that conference which reflects the reality that we're not just uh, focusing on the NPT countries but do acknowledge that uh, there are three big elephants outside the NPT room that we all know about, and we have to somehow find a way of bringing them within the non-proliferation and disarmament disciplines uh, that the NPT represents if we're going to have a, a saner world in this respect. But what might these action plans actually look like uh, against that background? I can't speak now completely for the Commission because all of this is work in progress. But the general direction in which I think we're heading, and which I'll flag at least as my personal view at this stage, is as follows. First of all, as to the short term, how are we defining the short term? I think it has to be a little bit beyond just the May 2010 uh, NPT conference, because although a number of things uh, are going to be, I believe, doable by that point, including hopefully the, uh, the start follow-on treaty in the US-Russia negotiations, there's clearly quite a few things that are not going to be doable or at least completable within that time frame, but in respect of which we still want to create a sense of urgency, a sense of this is the short term, not just steps uh, to be addressed sort of in an incremental way on into the indefinite future. So we're likely to define the short term uh, in terms of 2012, uh, which has the, the further advantage of reflecting the, the first uh, term, or the present term, I should say, more politely, of the Obama administration, but also reflecting what I think is achievable uh, within, with the appropriate will and energy uh, within a four-year term, uh, if not a two-year. Uh, there is an issue which the Commission is pondering as to whether we should argue for the holding of a new uh, special session on disarmament of the UN General Assembly in 2012 in order to sort of mark a short-term benchmark point, review point, forward-looking point. Uh, for some people, that's a, a dream institutional outcome. For others, it's a nightmare. And uh, we're in the process of really uh, weighing and balancing the utility of that. But in terms of going into 2010 and taking a package into the May uh, review conference, I think the way the Commission is thinking at the moment that there are two sort of tranches of things that ought to be sought to be accomplished at that conference. The first is uh, to try and update and get a re-articulation of the famous 13 steps of 2000 in the form of some kind of new international nuclear consensus of a kind into which not only the NPT member states could buy, uh, but which could have buy-in ultimately from the countries outside the NPT as well. Every time you mention 13 steps, this seems to generate frissons of anxiety around certain US quarters, and I think we might hear some of that from uh, Bob Einhorn a little later on today. But equally, I know Ambassador Sajardnan has, uh, has got some other views on that, so I'll let him articulate them. The second tranche of things that I think we all ought to be focusing on, I won't go into any detail about this because it's all familiar to you, 
is agreement on specific measures to strengthen the NPT, which we all know needs strengthening in a number of specific ways in the area of safeguards and verification, on the compliance and enforcement side, and also on the basic institutional side, although it is worth making the point, as Pierre Goldschmidt has been making very effectively over the last day or so, there's a lot the IEA can do within its present powers at the moment, which it's not doing as effectively as it might, and that needs to be borne in mind. To create a positive momentum uh, for these sorts of outcomes from the 2010 conference, a lot of things, however, do need to be done in this very short-term period leading up to it, uh, which are outside the formal NPT framework. And as I've said, some of these things, I think, are doable by May next year, but most can at best just get started. Although I said that I wasn't, and this commission won't be in the business of producing sort of laundry lists, let me just to be quick indicate uh, what I think the main seven things are that need to be done uh, between now and uh, 2010, at least by way of getting started. Um, the start follow on treaty speaks for itself, and that's something we would all hope could be completed in that time frame. Secondly, associated with that, the commencement of wider strategic dialogues with both Russia and China on the whole range of issues which we rather hope will be quarantined from the start negotiations in the case of Russia. In the case of China, issues which are clearly out there on the table, we've been discussing a lot of them these last two days, uh, but which will be important if we are going to create the conditions ultimately for an effective multilateral uh, process of disarmament. Third thing is, of course, CTBT, achieving, if humanly possible, U.S. ratification of that uh, by May next year, if not at least shortly thereafter, and generating all the momentum, however, that will come from the effort and the, the visible utility of this uh, for the NPT conference, I think, is very great. Uh, fourthly, FISAR material, clearly getting the conference on disarmament negotiations restarted, including on the issue of verification, uh, wrestling, I guess, with the issue of stocks in a way that will enable that to, to move on. Uh, and also, in the context of FISAR materially, getting something moving in this vast, sprawling, difficult area of uh, fuel banks and guaranteed uh, assurances of supply. But certainly, significant movement on the fissile material front. Uh, fifthly, uh, obviously, the securing loose materials enterprise, which has been given brand new energy and input by President Obama's uh, speech in Prague this week, and which has got a, a 2012 uh, time frame about it, which fits conveniently with the sort of four years that we're thinking about as the, the short term, uh, and all of which is, of course, hugely important in its own right. Um, sixthly, getting the Iran and DPRK problems as close as possible to a uh, solution as can be achieved within that time frame. I, for one, think that's doable in the case of Iran. I think it will take rather longer than that to get the DPRK in its present mood to actual denuclearization, but that shortly, certainly should be a shorter-term objective to, uh, to get things moving on both those fronts as far as possible. And finally, in this period, an early statement by the U.S., which may, I guess, have to now await the outcome of the Nuclear Posture Review, an early statement on the, the de-alerting issue, launch readiness, which we didn't hear anything about and would have rather liked to in the Obama speech, and also more generally on nuclear doctrine, some language to the effect that the only purpose of having nuclear weapons is to deter others from using them. Again, we, some of us were hoping, perhaps naively, optimistically, that that would be there in the Prague speech. Uh, we're also now, many of us, hoping, I hope with not as much naivety, that it will be there in a year or so's time after the nuclear posture review is completed. Well, that's about feeding into 2010. By 2012, one would hope uh, that all those things could be pretty much um, accomplished, and in addition, some other things would have happened as well, including some sort of agreement about how to move forward on residual state, uh, space issues, which are causing so much difficulty and anxiety, um, some agreement on how to bring the non-NPT nuclear armed states within the NPT-type disciplines, uh, presumably through some kind of parallel process, which will hopefully be rather better in the future than the India-US nuclear deal was, although that did have the advantage of demonstrating the parallel process could give you some advantages in terms of exposing things to safeguards that weren't previously but have left a lot of people disappointed. We would also hope that by 2012, on a completely different issue, some agreement could be reached on how the international community could share the costs of managing a really much more substantial and, and uh, effective disarmament and non-proliferation enterprise. 
But above all, one would hope that by 2012, within the next four years, with all the discussions that are going on, strategic dialogues and so on, we could have um, reached very significant agreement on a general strategy, uh, a general way forward for disarmament. And that takes me quickly into the medium term and longer term agendas that I think my commission will be trying to articulate with a little bit more precision perhaps than has been the case in some other discussions of this. In terms of the medium term, which for present purposes we're thinking about as the period running through to about 2025, the basic object as we're thinking about it again at the moment is to both set and get to a target um, minimalist vantage point. We're still wrestling with the appropriate metaphor, but I'll leave that discussion to one side. A minimalist vantage point which would be characterised by dramatically reduced numbers of warheads we're still debating what those numbers should be, whether it's possible to have any actual numbers or would it only be a formula, but certainly dramatically reduced. Um, secondly, dramatically reduced deployment um, of any of the weapons left in existence. Thirdly, nothing anywhere on high readiness, on high launch readiness. And fourthly, uh, common acceptance in military doctrine that the only purpose of nuclear weapons is to deter their use uh, by others. Um, again, whether or not no first use should be part of that kind of military doctrine or whether that's an add-on of more emotional than real-world utility is something the Commission is wrestling with. But we believe, I think, in our preliminary discussions that getting to a result like this with very low numbers, very little actual deployment, nothing on high readiness, and a common doctrine accepting that there's no other purpose for these things uh, in their potential use at all other than to deter others from using nuclear weapons. We think that would be a very much uh, better world than the one we have at the moment and one that is achievable within a time certain, by a date certain, and for present purposes 2025 seems to be workable. Finally, we do, however, think as a commission in terms of our preliminary discussions that is very, very difficult indeed to be as confident about setting date certain for the step, the final step from the minimalist vantage point so defined to actual zero. The truth of the matter is that there are a number of very big and very difficult conditions that will have to be satisfied. Many of them have been the subject of discussion uh, during this conference. Uh, political conditions, giving all states, all relevant states, uh, confidence that the final step uh, won't uh, put their security at risk. Uh, confidence about the effectiveness of verification uh, mechanisms on which Norway and the UK have been doing so much good work recently. Um, and confidence about compliance and enforcement for those who might be minded to break out of this new discipline. It's important in the middle of all this realism, however, about getting to the beyond 2025 final zero um, to keep our basic idealism intact. The ultimate goal must remain one. The ultimate goal that we must never lose sight of is the elimination of nuclear weapons and the effective outlawing of nuclear weapons uh, from the planet. The rationale for that goal, I think, must again also never be lost sight of. It was very well articulated, I think, by the original Canberra Commission and re-articulated as the central motif of the Blix Commission, namely that so long as any country has nuclear weapons, others will want them. So long as any country has nuclear weapons, they're bound one day to be used by accident, if not design, and any such use would be catastrophic. What's given us all a huge amount of renewed confidence that this message is actually now being heard is, of course, the emergence of, with the, all the commitment and all the leadership that's gone with it, of President Obama and his new administration. You in the United States are clearly getting your act together. It's time for the rest of the world to get its act together, and hopefully our new commission can play at least a small part in, it, in achieving that outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Gareth. We look forward to seeing the results. Now we know the, the, the outline. Uh, I have um, the pleasure of giving the floor to Ambassador uh, Sujadnal, who is the Indonesia's ambassador to the United States. Please, Ambassador. Thank you. That's great. That's great. Um,
Let me first of all extend my thanks and gratitude to the Carnegie Endowment for inviting me to share with you uh, some of my thoughts about what um, the um, NPT and its implementations from the perspective of uh, people like myself representing a uh, developing country, Indonesia, state party to the NPT, which is a uh, non-nuclear weapon state, and um, which only has uh, its um, uh, interest in the implementations of the nuclear uh, or the non-proliferation treaty as a state party non-nuclear weapon state. This um, will bring me to uh, the next um, points of, of my presentation was that I, of course, being the ambassador of Indonesia to the United States, my um, presentation here is without prejudice to my position as, you know, um, representing Indonesia bilaterally. So this is a matter of um, how I should uh, disclaim myself from um, saying something uh, uh, on behalf of the state, uh, of the of, of, of uh, my country. That is that I would like to approach the issue from the perspective of somebody who's been uh, some time with this issue. Um, my um, involvement in the NPT process uh, back to 1990, that is the first time when uh, I uh, joined this. 1990, I attended the review conference. 1995, I attended and participated. 2000, I was there. 2005, I was uh, chairman of the uh, uh, main committee one dealing with the questions of uh, nuclear disarmament. So with this, um, you know, uh, I would like to uh, see what uh, is going to uh, happen and what we expect to happen in 2010 and beyond, um, judging from what I have seen uh, within these last uh, two decades. 1990, for instance, it is a, it, a time when uh, state parties expected the uh, result of the uh, NBT review conference back then uh, for the state parties to be able to, um, pick, uh, to, to cultivate what happened um, surrounding the NPT review process. That is the end of the Cold War. Um, the sticking issue uh, at that point in time was that uh, there has been uh, two approaches into uh, actually uh, Article 6 of the NPT. That is that um, some of the non-nuclear weapon states, the major player of non-nuclear weapon states, um, thought that it is only a matter of how we uh, can um, implement, uh, state parties implement Article 6 um, in a kind of um, a, a, a step by, no, uh, in kind of, um, a step-by-step -step process. Um, this is on the part of the nuclear weapon states, and uh, for uh, the uh, non-nuclear weapon state, is a matter of how um, a time frame that can be uh, applied in terms of uh, implementations of Article 6 uh, dealing with the nuclear disarmament. So the uh, stalemate at the very end process of the 1990 has drawn uh, the process into collapse, and uh, there is no um, a, a outcome documents that can be produced by the uh, state parties in 1990. 1995 is different things. We, the state party, are asked, were asked uh, by Article uh, 10 to, to um, uh, discuss or to, 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 to decide whether the treaty is going to be, as, as you may all know, to be extended indefinitely or extended uh, for some period of time. And came at the end of the um, review process a, a decision by the state parties and resolutions, um, the two that w was uh, then uh, very fundamental kind of, of, of documents that is being referred to by the state parties within the context of in reviewing implementation of the NPT from 1995 until the year 2000. In year 2000, circumstances allowed the uh, state parties to, as you all know, uh, adopt uh, the uh, documents, outcome documents, uh, agreed by consensus. Uh, which contain this uh, very important one uh, uh, aspect of the implementation of the NPT, namely on the in its relation to the implementation of Article 6, that's that uh, we uh, adopted the 13th step. Now, um, I uh, was asked uh, to um, discuss uh, the, uh, uh, the 13th steps, uh, at least when I received uh, the, the, the invitation by Carnegie Norman uh, for, for me to speak. Of course, I will deal with this, but I would like to offer you uh, what my uh, thinking about uh, what going to uh, happen in 2010, uh, judging from what uh, happened, say, for instance, in 1995, 2000, and 2005. Of course, 2005 was a failure. Um, the uh, fact that only to adopt the agenda, the PREPCOM 3 in 2004, Adopt, uh, supposed to um, produce recommendations for 2005 review conference, but only to adopt the agenda we fail. But, uh, and only uh, the uh, PREPCOM 2004, which I uh, have pri privileged to chair, 
um, uh, able to uh, only recommend to the uh, review conference the president on only can we able to uh, recommend to the 2005 who is going to be the president for 2005 review conference so a very um, uh, a meager steps that was uh, taken by the state parties in 2004 which um, coupled with different kind of um, you know, uh, factors that involved in 2005 review conference, then um, it uh, has drawn the 2005 review conference to, 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 to collapse. Um, in my uh, views, uh, judging from this uh, long uh, you know, um, involvement in this process, I thought that um, it is a kind of conventional wisdom of seeing uh, what is uh, happening in, 2000, in 1990 until 2005, and then um, uh, how um, country like Indonesia, for instance, state party like Indonesia, would like to contribute into the, um, uh, the achievement of the goal, uh, of the objective of the NPT as uh, contained in its preamble paragraph, and um, how we will implement uh, uh, articles of the NPT, uh, particularly those that deal with uh, Article 1 and 2, Article uh, 4, Article uh, 3, Article 6. So these are what a uh, country like Indonesia being state party wanted to see uh, the process to take place in 2010 to be focused on this, uh, this implementation of this article with a view to or in the context of achieving the uh, goal uh, step in the preamble paragraph of the, uh, of the, of the, uh, con of the um, uh, treaty. Um, what I thought involved in uh, going to be uh, a successful con uh, conference in 2005 was, was that I uh, have observed that uh, political and uh, strategic circumstances always surround uh, what uh, the NPT review conference is like. So uh, we may discuss about what happened in 2005, what happened in 2000, uh, and also what happened in 1995. All of um, the factors that involve the political and strategic circumstances surrounding the uh, review conference and relations, and the relations between or amongst the major players, uh, very much involved in the decisions making process of the conference. And secondly, a very important one, very conventional, uh, I mean, a kind of conventional wisdom, uh, that political will of the leadership of the uh, state party, major, major state parties, especially nuclear weapon states. And this is very important if you uh, recall back and uh, say in uh, 1995 review conference when uh, finally because of the uh, decision at the very high level of the uh, nuclear weapon states uh, allowing uh, the 1995 to produce uh, outcome documents and also uh, the involvement of uh, those that uh, be willing to accommodate, uh, you know, uh, its other positions that uh, can only 1995 produce result. And the third factor will be the negotiator, the negotiator at the review conference. Those that involve in the practical step in this uh, three or four weeks of a review conference, um, preceded by, you know, uh, a process of preparations in three uh, consecutive uh, uh, preparatory committee meeting, uh, the um, fact that the, the review conference and in the review conference uh, attend um, a number of, you know, uh, very uh, 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 active participants in the negotiations, then those also have a very uh, crucial role uh, playing in the context of uh, making the review conference a success uh, and or, or failure. So um, talking about the political and strategic circumstances, of course, the um, review conference and uh, the uh, the NPT process and uh, the uh, practical things uh, involve the interests of the, of the strategic interests of nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states in, uh, in, in, their, in their relations uh, that pertain to their possessions of nuclear weapons uh, very uh, much involved in the decisions of the review conference. Two separate but uh, very uh, kind, of, kind of integral process that is uh, bilateral and um, uh, multilateral process uh, and uh, in, in involvement of number of nuclear weapon states. So two separate process, but uh, integrated in terms of influencing to each other. Now, uh, let me uh, see what uh, happened in 2000, uh, 1999 and 2000 as the starting point on how we will see, or at least Indonesia, uh, see uh, what is going to um, happen or what we expect to happen in 2010. Back in 1995, the decisions on the strength and review process is very important one for Indonesia. So 
the uh, fact that we um, uh, agreed to, 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 to uh, extend definitely, indefinitely the NPT in 1995 based on our agreement to adopt the decisions uh, and the resolution of the Middle East uh, was seen by a country like Indonesia as a very fundamental basis for us to see what going to happen in uh, 2010. And then uh, what happened in 2000 review conference, that is uh, uh, 13 practical steps. No, come to uh, the point where I would like to say that 2010 um, is a place where we uh, really would like to see what uh, have been agreed in 1995 and 2000, which we could not agree in 2005. So um, it is a matter of how to see uh, the NPT review conference as a, a continuous and uh, sustained process of achieving the objective and principle contained in the preamble paragraph of the NPT. So seeing 1995 and 2000 uh, and uh, agreeing on uh, seeing it as a basis for us to see 2010 with a few to and, and, and in the context of achieving the preamble paragraph of the um, NPT is a, a process that we would like to see. Back in, uh, I have mentioned 1995, decision on the strength and review process in resolution in the Middle East. Now um, let me uh, see what um, I what, what uh, the 2000 review conference uh, decisions uh, outcome that is important for a country like Indonesia to be uh, put as a basis for 2010. There is that uh, 13 steps. Um, some of the 13 steps have uh, been seen by uh, state parties involved in 2005 review conference as obsolete, as uh, something that uh, has uh, to be uh, revisited or at least or, or, or even even being left um, a bit because it is irrelevant to the circumstances in 2005. Well, country like Indonesia, state party like Indonesia would like to see, as I said, NPTS a continuous process as a sustained process that uh, from one to the next review conference is a, is a kind of um, uh, process toward the achievement of, of the goal as set in its preamble paragraph. So what has achieved, what has been achieved 2000, uh, in 1995, what has been achieved in the year 2000 is being seen as a continuous, as, as, it, uh, as a continuous process. So um, first on the 13th step, the signing of the CDBT, I was asked by the um, organizer of this uh, conference uh, in a piece of paper uh, to answer what, what, is, what is the likelihood for Indonesia to uh, be uh, the, uh, uh, to ratify the CDBT. Well, as um, you all know that in the process of uh, implementing democratic principles, uh, we, the government, um, have to listen very carefully of what the constituent is going to, or, or has been saying and uh, what, would, what they would like to say in terms of our position to ratify or not CDBT first. And secondly, amongst the uh, constitution, uh, among the constituent of, um, uh, of, of the, the government nowadays, um, involved in the kind of um, domestic politics, they all see that, um, why should, the, the, the questions that they, in, in many occasions, they said, why should us, why should Indonesia, which is a party to the non proliferation treaty, we are the one who took, have taken initiative to establish this Soros Asia nuclear weapon free zone, and uh, now we are striving for its implementations by you know all uh, parties and uh, beyond uh, also uh, countries beyond the regions. We are an active uh, participants, uh, actively taken part in many disarmament activities. Why? And, and we are non nuclear weapons. Still. Why should, should us? So we would like uh, some of our constituents said that we would like to see first. We would like to. Um, with first um, the uh, step taken by uh, you know, uh, nuclear weapon state parties to uh, nuclear weapon states, uh, signatory of the CDPT to take their step, ratify or not, then we will be waiting. This is the, the approach taken by some of our constituents, constituents. So this is a matter of how the domestic politic will, will, will uh, uh, prevail in terms of um, influencing the government decision. Now on uh, what we expect in 2010, of course, an outcome which um, not only in terms of um, paper to be adopted by consensus, but paper that, are, uh, that contains uh, the commitment of state parties to implement uh, its, commit in its obligations, uh, to live up its obligations or their obligations uh, in accordance with the uh, provisions of the NPT, especially Article 1, 2, 6, 3, and 4, and um, how um, we will see the 2010 
um, as a uh, makeup uh, of the uh, failure in 2005. Number of um, few points which uh, I think um, worth considering in our, uh, uh, at least from, from the perspective of uh, state party like Indonesia is that we would like to see um, the documents to uh, contain uh, um, a statement on the um, importance of universal applications of non proliferations and disarmament principles. A second, uh, a commitment or um, willingness to take a collective step to strengthen non proliferation application, including mechanism to further enhance, strengthen the safeguard of the IAEA and um, the capacity of the IA safeguard uh, to uh, deal with uh, the new challenges. Um, third will be the reaffirmations of commitment um, to the, um, well, this is, this is the letter of the, the NPT, to the in, in, inalienable rights to peaceful uses of nuclear energy. Of course, this is, should be in conformity with Article 1, 2, and 3. And then we would like to see the uh, 2010 uh, to contain also commitments on, um, on, on or, or agreement, agreement on the achievable and implementable nuclear uh, policies and steps within the context of the implementation of Article 6, and then the practical means to provide assurances against the use or threat of use of nuclear weapons to non-nuclear weapon states. And um, we would like to see, uh, you know, the outcome, uh, among other things, uh, on a great step to counter and prevent uh, nuclear terrorism. And uh, next will be uh, a great step uh, leading to the full implementation of the 1995 um, resolution on the Middle East and decisions on the strength and review process. And we also would like to see the 2010 uh, a, a conference, review conference which can produce um, a willingness or intentions uh, or even a commitment by state parties be willing to promote education, training, and engagement of civil society in strengthening the NPT norm. So these are some of my thoughts about what happened within these last few years in terms of implementation of the NPT and what we expect to happen in 2010 review conference. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador. We will now turn to an Egypt, Egyptian perspective uh, from the uh, minister at the uh, uh, Egyptian embassy in London. Yes. Uh, Mr. Sameh, you have the floor. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm delighted to be back here uh, in my private capacity and uh, would like first to thank uh, the Carnegie uh, endowment for their invitation again. Well, I'll try to make my remarks uh, very brief and short because of uh, time uh, limits. And in this respect, I will limit myself to what I consider to be some of the practical steps in five areas to move forward to 2010 and beyond. Now, for those who will be interested in looking at other ideas I'm putting forward, they can go back to the book uh, abolishing nuclear weapons by the Carnegie. My, art, my article is there. Now, the first area is the NPT itself and the review conference. The NPT review conference represents a real window of opportunity to build on previous commitments, such as those made in 2000, and to take concrete steps to achieve progress towards a nuclear weapon-free world. Now, the responsibility to achieve that lies with all of us, nuclear, and non-nuclear weapon states, members and non-members of the NPT. We must constructively utilize the remaining time before 2010 with a more intensive ongoing discussion. The NPT before and beyond 2000 itself needs to be strengthened. We should look at setting up a permanent secretariat and move towards creating an organization we could also consider ways to ensure continuity in the annual process and raise the tempo, perhaps by having a fourth PREPCOM. Member states should consider ways of raising the political profile of the NPT as well. How about making the upcoming NPT review conference in 2010 a ministerial level meeting? We have recognized the need to think along the lines of summits on the topics of energy, population, food, 
I've just come from London, G20, and climate change, etc. Why can't there be a summit for a nuclear-free world? Such a summit would provide a potential mechanism also to achieve the universality of the NPT. More than 10 years ago, the foreign ministers of seven countries, Brazil, Egypt, Ireland, Mexico, New Zealand, South Africa, and Sweden, joined together to form the New Agenda Coalition. The need for a new impetus of such energy is as strong as ever today. We can pull together the 13 steps from the 2000 Review Conference with the many other proposals made by member states and expert groups and panels and commissions as the vehicle for achieving this aim. An attempt to merge these initiatives will have a much better chance of achieving global consensus. What we need is a cross-regional, multilateral, and multicultural dialogue for this purpose, one with a clear objective of a world free of nuclear weapons. We need a revitalized new agenda coalition to work closely with the new U.S. administration, especially in light of the last speech of President Obama. Point two, the conference on disarmament. Now, on nuclear disarmament, the conference on disarmament has a special role to play. It is a unique forum that we tend to forget. It includes the P5 plus the three non-NPT members. It should immediately establish an appropriate subsidiary body with a mandate to deal with nuclear disarmament. Much more could be done in Geneva. There is a vast potential and expertise that can make a difference, but if we have the political will. In this context, the following steps in the conference would be appropriate. A discussion by an ad hoc group of the steps that would lead towards a systematic and progressive efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons. A dialogue among states that possess nuclear weapons and those that do not on practical steps that would lead to the elimination and a clear commitment in this respect. Technical seminars to address the issues of scope, definitions, and verification. Development of ad hoc exchanges to establish a precedent that non-nuclear weapon states have a legitimate interest and right to question nuclear weapon states on nuclear disarmament matters and to hold them accountable. The Conference on Disarmament must begin negotiations on a non-discriminatory, multilateral, and verifiable treaty banning the production of fissile material based on the Shannon Mandate. Time is ripe, and with a view to completing a final draft within five years before the 2015 Review Conference. The deadlock over establishing an ad hoc committee on the FMCT must be broken. A group of experts should be convened with the new session opening in mid-May to discuss all the relevant details. Moving to the Middle East, 14 years have elapsed since the adoption of the 1995 resolution, Middle East Resolution. It is clear that new impetus must be given to this agenda. We should not miss the opportunity we have. It should be suggested that the Review Conference should appoint a special coordinator for the resolution who, whose role will be to oversee its implementation. The coordinator would facilitate a route to constructive dialogue in the framework of the resolution and to begin immediate practical steps to convene an international Middle East conference with the objective of establishing a legally binding and internationally and effectively verifiable treaty for a Middle East free zone. The establishment of a nuclear weapon free zone in the Middle East is a first step towards creating an effectively verifiable zone of weapons of mass destruction, including the nuclear, chemical, biological weapons and their delivery systems. It's a long process. All states in the region, including Israel, must acknowledge and accept a challenging and deep responsibility towards achieving regional security. Looking forward from here, 
The universality of the MPT is critical to regional and global security because states outside the treaty fundamentally weaken it by continuing the nuclear danger and weakening the benefits of membership for their neighbors. For 2010 and beyond, I would suggest that an NPT universality adherence support unit should be considered in the review conference to address directly the mechanisms that will bring states outside the treaty into the NPT as non-nuclear weapon states. Four, beyond the review conference and approaching the issue of the nuclear zero, we must not let the momentum that has grown now fade. We must keep our eyes on the goal of the total elimination and the assurance that they will never be produced again. This will require an active negotiation of a nuclear weapons convention as called for by the UN Secretary General last October. It is a logical conclusion to the current Zero project and all states need to engage seriously with this project. For the vision of the Zero to be credible, the permanent members of the UN Security Council should take the lead at an early stage. We have seen recently the link between nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation explicitly acknowledged by several key statesmen, and this is warmly welcomed. This agenda must now include verification, the progressive deep reduction of operationally deployed strategic warheads and a freeze in upgrading, modernizing, and replacing existing weapons. The role of nuclear weapons in military doctrines must be dramatically reduced with the total objective of elimination. The P5 needs to take action in a coordinated matter, manner and to show leadership. Finally, the issue of trust and its relevance to the way forward. The concept of trust remains poorly understood, yet it is central to our work on the future of nuclear disarmament and arms control. Mutual trust is a key to any process of cooperation among nations. It's about a constructive dialogue across regional exchange, reaching out and crossing bridges. It is about mutual interest and respect for differences and security for all, not for one side. We need a genuine and candid conversation about nuclear disarmament between officials and experts from nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states. There hasn't been such a conversation for a long time. We need to exploit all the opportunities that can exist to make this happen. And to invite into this conversation representatives of the civil society and NGOs who can contribute constructively in this regard, giving also the proper role to gender and the culture of making peace and pushing peace in different regions of the world. Thank you so much. Well, these are uh, good and rich introductions. We have one more. If I stand up and leave, uh, Bob, it's not because I protest, <laughs> but simply because uh, time is running. But I have the pleasure of introducing Bob Einhorn, please. Uh, thank you, Minister, and I know you're going to have to leave in the next uh, minute or so. Uh, our goal at the 2010 uh, NPT Review Conference uh, shouldn't merely be to avoid another debacle like in 2005 uh, or to achieve a uh, consensus uh, final document by papering over uh, basic differences. Uh, we should set our uh, sights much higher. Uh, we should be much more ambitious about the 2010 review conference, uh, we should seek a renewed and reinvigorated NPT bargain. Uh, the original NPT bargain remains sound, uh, but clearly it's fraying. Uh, we need to shore it up uh, to update it and strengthen it for the decades ahead. The next uh, 12 months uh, should be a period of very active diplomacy to explore and hopefully agree upon a renewed uh, nuclear bargain. 
In the interest of time, I won't try to outline what the substantive elements of an NPT bargain, of a renewed bargain, uh, might be. Uh, instead, I'd like to focus on five principles that I believe should guide the effort. First, uh, we should give roughly equal weight to the three original pillars of the NPT, nonproliferation, disarmament, and the peaceful uses of nuclear energy. And we should pursue uh, these uh, three elements in a balanced way. Uh, these three pillars are integrally related. Without nonproliferation, it would be much too risky to expand nuclear energy worldwide. Without disarmament, international support for tough, tough nonproliferation measures uh, would be inadequate. Uh, and we should add a fourth pillar, preventing nuclear terrorism. Uh, the detonation of a single terrorist nuclear bomb anywhere in the world would gravely undermine prospects for the three other pillars. Second is the principle of reciprocal responsibility, which Jim Steinberg mentioned yesterday. Today's nuclear threats uh, put the security and well-being of all states in jeopardy, and all states must therefore do what they can to reduce those threats. Of course, the nuclear weapon states bear special responsibility to pursue nuclear disarmament and to move with conviction toward a world without nuclear weapons, as President Obama pledged to do on Sunday. Uh, and the, nu the non-nuclear weapon states bear a critical responsibility uh, to work energetically to prevent additional countries from acquiring nuclear weapons. That responsibility doesn't end with their decision to forego their own nuclear capabilities and to accept IAEA safeguards to verify that decision. It must continue through the participation of those non-nuclear weapon states in rigorous collective efforts to impede other countries from joining the nuclear club because their own security and well-being are affected by whether they're living in a world of more and more nuclear armed states. Third, NPT parties should stop acting like members of special interest groups. Nuclear weapon states or non-nuclear weapon states, uh, developing countries or developed countries, uh, members of security alliances or members of the non-aligned movement. Uh, when it comes to nuclear dangers, we're all in the same boat. Disarmament is not a favor to non-nuclear weapon states. Non-proliferation is not a favor to the nuclear weapon states. And the civil uses of nuclear energy uh, is not a favor to developing countries. Uh, we each have a stake uh, in each of the three pillars. Diplomatic engagement in the coming year should be inclusive and wide-ranging, not confined uh, to uh, to consensus building within separate caucuses. Uh, sure, the P5 countries will meet, uh, as will the NAM countries, but the groups should be speaking to one another uh, and not just among themselves. Fourth, uh, NPT parties should set aside slogans and dogmatic positions and seek pragmatic solutions that work. We should look uh, forward uh, and not fight old battles. Uh, I personally supported the 13 steps in 2000, and I thought it was unwise uh, for the United States to walk away from, from those 13 steps so dismissively. Uh, but things have changed. Uh, not all of those steps are relevant today. Uh, and let's not waste time uh, debating whether to resurrect those steps. Uh, let's instead create a new and a more promising agenda for the years ahead. And on promoting the responsible growth of civil nuclear energy, uh, let's stop talking about legal abstractions. Uh, instead, let's explore practical means of meeting the genuine economic and other needs of countries embarking on or expanding their civil nuclear programs. Uh, and let's do so in a way that also serves our collective security interest in preventing the destabilizing spread of nuclear weapons production facilities. Fifth, uh, we should seek a more equitable sharing 
of the burdens of disarmament and nonproliferation. For example, take the issue of verification. In verifying nonproliferation, it makes sense for the states prohibited from having nuclear weapons to bear the lion's share of the safeguards burden. The nonproliferation rationale for applying IAEA safeguards in nuclear weapon states uh, is less compelling, and the costs can be prohibitive. But when it comes to verifying disarmament and the need for nuclear weapon states to reassure one another and the world community at large that they're abiding by their obligations, that's a different story. And so in multilateral measures like the Fissile Material Control Treaty or bilateral measures like the START follow-on agreement, the burden of accepting more extensive verification should shift to the nuclear weapon states. Uh, we should also seek a more equitable sharing of the burden of nuclear disarmament among the nuclear weapon states. Uh, with Russia and the U.S. now possessing well over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, they clearly deserve to continue taking the lead in reducing nuclear arsenals. But there's no reason that responsibility for reducing the numbers and the role of nuclear weapons and demonstrating transparency should fall exclusively on them. All nuclear weapon states including those that chose not to join the Nonproliferation Treaty, bear a responsibility to exercise nuclear restraint. Some current nuclear powers, notably the United Kingdom and France, have already taken steps to cut back their limited nuclear capabilities. Yet some other uh, nuclear powers uh, are now both increasing and upgrading the nuclear forces and demonstrating very little transparency. It will be hard to move toward a, a nuclear-free world uh, if some continue building up while others uh, are building down. I'm sure there are other principles that uh, can be articulated. Many of you will have some in mind. These are the five I wanted to uh, mention today in the limited time uh, available. I think if we follow them over the next year, uh, not only can we uh, ensure uh, a successful NPT review conference, uh, but we can also uh, renew uh, and reinvigorate the NPT bargain uh, for years to come. Thank you. I, I want to thank Bob and, and all the speakers for some very uh, constructive, concrete suggestions. Um, we're, we're running later than we had thought, uh, but in bumping two principles in each other, timeliness and discussion, but I want to err on the side of discussion because we're kind of bleeding into the reception and you can drink more at home. Um, <laughs> and, and, and so we'll, we'll go to, uh, the plan would be to go to, uh, to 340 instead of 330 and then move to, uh, to, to the reception. Um, and so let me take two questions at a time, though. So I'll start with Avner and then uh, this gentleman over here. Thank you. Hi, Avner Cohen, University of Maryland. Uh, in the spirit of the effort to try to be uh, honest, transparent, and trust, as one of the participants said, I have a question to all uh, four or five members of the, uh, of the panel. As you know, there are three weapons state outside NPT, alphabetically India, Israel, and Pakistan. Two are declared, one is not, not acknowledged. My question is, how do you think you should address the question of Israel? I'll say two words about that. Uh, for some time, George and I, George Perkovich and I, have a very friendly discussion about that. George believed that uh, Israel should be addressed by reference to unsafeguard fission material. I, myself, on the other hand, believe that Israel should be addressed first as a nuclear armed state. I think for reasons of ethics, reasons of politics, reality cannot be denied, reality cannot be fudged, reality cannot be put aside. I think it's healthy, it's transparent to treat a nation as she is, whether she wants it or not. So my question is, and I think it's useful, because one should understand why that particular nation with a specific case had gone nuclear so early on, in fact, 
just a little bit before the nuclear non-proliferation was signed. Israel could have tested, according to my research, by, 1967, by 1966, just before the deadline. So my question to all of you is, how do you think the issue of Israel, if you want Israel to be engaged, how this issue has to be addressed? Thank you, Omer. You're younger, so you have to be briefer, okay? Uh, I, I will be concrete. That's even better. Great. Uh, my name is Christian Renjifo, a U.S. consulting company. I would like to ask a concrete question to the, to the panel. Uh, actually, basically, the issue of fuel banks. Two of the three of the panelists, well, two of the panelists mentioned fuel banks. Mr. Einhorn hinted to it somehow. And the ambassadors from Indonesia and Egypt, I didn't hear the word fuel bank in their remarks. Maybe 15 or 20 years ago, this question had been hypothetical, but now it's pretty much <laughs> possible. I would like to know the position in principle of the ambassador of Indonesia and Egypt regarding to the establishment of a IA fuel bank taking into consideration that such a fuel bank would not uh, limit the rights, Article 4 rights of the countries that could establish the fuel bank. So pretty much the time has come, it seems. I just would like to know the position, the personal position of the Egyptian and Indonesian ambassador. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. What I want to do actually is ask Daryl, so we'll have three questions, because I think we can remember them, Israel and fuel banks, CTBT. <laughs> You know me quite well, George. I guarantee you this question is easier than Avner's, though. Um, I have a question for our excellencies from Indonesia and uh, in Egypt regarding the test ban. As you know, uh, the Article 6 of the NPT obligates all states to pursue nuclear disarmament. Uh, all, your two countries have signed the CTBT. Um, in Indonesia's case, I understand why you might want to see what other countries do, but if the United States and China were to ratify the treaty, how might that change Indonesia's calculus? Uh, and regarding Egypt, uh, given the value that a conference of Tespian Treaty might contribute to achieving a nuclear weapon-free zone in the Middle East, uh, what are your thoughts about Egypt's leadership role in ratifying the Tespian Treaty to provide an example for countries like Israel and Iran, uh, as to how they might uh, behave in the future on this regard. Can we work from the freshest question up? Um, Ambassador, can, could you uh, address the, the CTBT question? We'll go to Sami, and then you can work your way back through the, the question. Thank you. Um, at least uh, the Indonesian government can uh, have a better position to convince their counterpart in the parliament that we need to ratify. So your question is that if USA and, the Ch and China ratify, then a um, the matter of uh, the domestic political process, we will have better position to convince them that look, um, you all um, uh, ask about uh, you know a nuclear weapon state to ratify first, and no, they ratify, and then we can convince them. This is a, a political process uh, at domestic domestic level. So I think this answers the question. Okay. Sorry, more. Yeah. Uh, on the CTVT, well, we look to the U.S. for leadership on this. China, India. Now, in the Middle East, we can take things by a la carte. If we want to handle these things in the Middle East, we have the resolution, the 95 resolution. Let's appoint a special coordinator and work on the steps that would bring the universality of the NPT and other WMD conventions in the region. That's my answer. Anybody else then on fuel bank or CTBT? But the questions on CTBT were concrete to Egypt and Indonesia. I'm not sure if you got the answer you were looking for, but you got an answer. Um, <laughs> Dialogue is helpful. Thank um, you, George. Well, just on the question of how to deal with Israel, for all practical discussion purposes in policy reviews and commission reports of the kind that uh, my group will be writing, we have no difficulty about referring to Israel as a nuclear armed state and, um, and referring generically to all the nuclear armed states in that, in that terminology. There is a bit of a difficulty, obviously, um, if you were to have an Israeli signatory um, to a formal report because of the metaphysical problems of, uh, of talking other than in terms of safeguarded or unsafeguarded. And, and, for all, and for more formal purposes than the kind of discussion we do on these occasions or in these reports, um, there is something to be said, not just from the Israeli perspective of maintaining strategic ambiguity, etc., uh, but from the perspective of a number of countries in the region other than Israel who um, really are quite uncomfortable with the notion of um, formally uh, bringing 
Israel out of the closet in this respect because of the worries about the political implications of that in terms of their own domestic politics and the, the additional pressure that they feel that would place upon them uh, to go down the sort of matching route. So I have to say I started life with a rather more robust approach to uh, this issue and why the hell just don't we talk about it uh, openly and frankly for all practical purposes and for all formal purposes as well. Uh, but it is a little bit more complicated than that and you do have to, to wind this path. And I think George's familiar distinction between um, safeguarded and unsafeguarded countries is, is a, a good enough vehicle for managing that. Um, on the fuel banks issue, well, you've got to speak for yourselves, I guess, from... Uh, Indonesia and Egypt, but um, from the Commission's point of view, this is an issue we're obviously wrestling with, uh, the utility and, um, um, of having fuel banks or guaranteed fuel supply in terms of creating a more uh, proliferation-resistant environment in the future. Um, it's very difficult to see this as being the answer to all our problems uh, in this respect, partly because the, uh, there's no great willingness on the part of most of the, um, the fuel producers at the moment to either multilateralise or internationalise their own facilities, so the old double standards arguments keep on cropping up. And in terms of um, the actual sort of utility of having an available resource like this to stop those countries that are determined to acquire fissile uh, manufacturing capability, it's obviously not going to have much use in, in that context. But as an addition to the general um, international framework that we all want to create, where there's much less of a disposition to go down the, and to give excuses for going down the fissile material producing path, I'd love us to be able to get more agreement than has been apparent so far on that front. Just very quickly. Yeah, go ahead. On, each, on any of you. Yeah. Um, I see, Avner, there's a long standing debate with him, but I see very little to be gained and much to be lost uh, in Israel abandoning its uh, policy of strategic ambiguity. On the fuel bank question, I'm aware of no current proposal regarding fuel banks or international fuel cycle centers uh, that require countries to give up rights. Uh, yet lots of people talk about the denial of rights. Uh, President, President Obama on Sunday said, we're not talking about the denial of rights. We shouldn't be doing that. Uh, this is an issue that really needs to be handled pragmatically and not ideologically. And if we look at it from the practical needs of countries expanding on or, or uh, embarking on nuclear energy programs, I think we can find a solution. On the Israeli one, uh, well, I commend what President Obama, the new spirit that he's bringing, and I think we should look to the White House uh, in this respect. So this language uh, coming on Israel, I don't think it's the right time now. And plus, we have excellent examples in uh, history. South Africa dismantled a whole program, Brazil and Argentina as well. We had the new CIS converted the nuclear weapons to Russia. So we have success stories. We need to work on a process, engage in discussions, and bring things to reality. Thank you, Sally. Um, is this, uh, are you, you, you're, you're so reticent. Come forward to the microphone. You get to ask the last question, and then I'm going to ask everybody to be seated because Deep D wants to come out, and, and I've asked her to come make just two minutes of closing remarks, but please. Okay, thanks for your time. Um, I I'm Farrah Stockman with the Boston Globe. This is for Bob Einhorn or, or whoever else might have insight. I'm just wondering if you have insight on the administration's position on the India deal, the, um, uh, the Bush administration's India deal, and whether this might be a model that is going to be followed in the future to bring other uh, nations uh, that might have nuclear weapons under some sort of umbrella. Um, I have no particular insights. I, I'm speaking uh, personally. Uh, my understanding is the Obama administration wants very good uh, relations with India uh, and intends to implement the, uh, the deal that was adopted over the last uh, 18 months. Can I get on the field bank? I think from the, most of the rest of the international community's point of view, the, the good news about the India deal is that it does demonstrate that there is a kind of bilateral process and maybe there are plurilateral or multilateral ones as well in the NSG role and this demonstrates that by which you can find ways of bringing uh, the elephants outside the NPT room into, at least partly into the room when it comes to safeguarding certain facilities and so on. And that, that's a first step forward and it does, does demonstrate that such a process is available. The bad news is it wasn't a very good deal uh, from the point of view of most of the rest of the world, um, apart from India and the US. 
uh, because, of course, it was quite inexplicit on limiting India's capacity to go on manufacturing fissile material. It was even inexplicit on the question of uh, India testing. Um, although, in practice, I think that would be a bit of a showstopper for the continuation of the deal. But uh, I don't think it ought to be dismissed uh, out of hand at all in the way some of the more robust uh, critics would like to do. I think we ought to use it as, a, as an imperfect base for a step forward, focusing not so much on the virtues or otherwise of particular countries, but rather the applicability of general criteria uh, to deals of this kind and identify the criteria, and then if a country fits them, that's great. Ambassador Sunajan wants to address the fuel bank. I would just add on the India deal, I'm not sure of what it's a model, but go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you on this uh, ideas to establish this nuclear, uh, the fuel banks. Uh, first is that we are open to these um, ideas and I uh, would like to see what is going to be the, the format uh, of uh, such kind of um, uh, a new establishment, if going to be the case. But uh, the most important uh, leap for us is that we would like to uh, see um, a establishment of new institution which does not um, then uh, uh, prolong the, uh, the status of, uh, of privileged and non-privileged uh, 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 countries, which is that uh, a right to um, uh, implement programs and nuclear weapon and nuclear uh, Peaceful uses of nuclear energy is in the hand of, of, of every state, guaranteed by Article 4 of the NPT. So we are open, but in any case, we would like to see it in the context of implementations of Article 4 of the NPT. Yeah, maybe I'll just add that plus Article uh, 4, of course, of the NPT, the issue is considered in the IEAEA. So we, this is, as far as Egypt is concerned, it's being dealt with there. Right. So there are 12 projects, I think, so now. Yeah. So. That's correct. All right, um, I want to do two things. Before I, th well, yes, in this order. I'm going to thank the panel, but I also, I, I'm seeing a, a, one of our trustees at the Carnegie Endowment, and these people helped make this uh, happen, also Tavitian, uh, who's been here all day, uh, both days, and I just want to thank him because it gives all of us a lot of support and confidence when our trustees pay uh, as much attention as work and to take two days out of your valuable time uh, I want to uh, acknowledge that and thank that. And I then want to thank our panel. And then I'm going to ask Deepti to thank uh, all of you and instruct us on our way to the reception. Great. Thank you. And also our thanks to Minister Storr. Unfortunately, he had another meeting he needed to run off to. And it's always great to have George because clearly he can just uh, jump in and, and manage a, a session like that. Thanks, George. So ladies and gentlemen, I think the results of this conference speak for themselves. We've seen how the concepts of build or break run parallel to those of hope and peril. And it's this choice that this year brought some of the leading minds from around the world to Washington, D.C., making, making this conference the largest and most international we have had yet. We've heard great debate and deliberation, and I hope all of us will leave today feeling educated and determined to do our bit to build. So to help us build on the results of this gathering, in a few days you'll receive a brief survey. Please provide us with your feedback on this conference, and more importantly, your ideas for the next. In this way, we really aim to make this conference your conference. It may not always be apparent, but the panels we had reflected the ideas that you communicated to us. So to that end, I know that some, it's sometimes hard to choose amongst the concurrent sessions that we have, and some of you um, have expressed your angst to me in going through that process, and I apologize for it. But I'm told a little angst is good for the soul, and it's a mark of a strong agenda. So I hope that uh, you know that there will be videos, photos, transcripts, audios of the other sessions on our website. And I encourage you to continue to keep checking out our website. I understand some materials are already up there. And then finally, on behalf of the Carnegie Endowment, I want to thank all of our speakers for their contributions and all of the attendees for the lively, thoughtful, and provocative participation you've all de demonstrated. You have made this conference a success. And also a huge word of thanks to all of the Carnegie staff who helped George and I plan and execute this conference, making it seem so effortless. And my deep thanks also go out to nonproliferation junior fellow Kim Misher, whose tremendous efforts and rare talents I have relied upon heavily for the last eight months. 
So I look forward to seeing you at the next conference, which is likely to take place near the end of 2010. I don't really want to think about it right now, so don't ask me any questions. But I hope to see you even sooner at the closing reception, which we will have in the Polaris Room. So please join me in thanking again this terrific panel and all of you. Thanks.